Impact Lounge is the number one YouTube channel for fans of Impact Wrestling. Make, make a, make a, uh, a good, good lucha, lucha thing. That is just a fact of life. Hello, welcome back to the Impact Lounge review uh, of this week's Impact episode. I'm your host, Adam, and I'm joined by Ro, as always. Good evening to you, Ro. Good morning to you, Adam. How's it going? Yeah, good. A really early one for me this morning. Look at that. That's dedication to this channel. Uh, getting up at six o'clock in the morning on my day off to record this show. So uh, if I can do that, you guys can hit the subscribe button and leave us some comments. That's all we ask for. So if it is your first time stopping by, please do make sure to to do that. Uh, either to, to leave some comments on, the, on, on our review or about the show or just questions that you'd like us to ask in the future. And if this is your first time stopping by, you may not know the format of our show, but what we tend to do is talk about some uh, news-related stuff or answer your questions, ask you a trivia question before diving straight into the review. So uh, before we do that, I've got to say, I think this was a first for the trivia question this week. We only got one right answer. So, Ro, do you want to remind us what the questions were? Yes, it was, you know, who am I? And the three clues were I debuted, debuted in TNA with a former world champion and the son of a Hall of Famer. I got something in common with Mankind, The Undertaker, and Kane. And my former tag team partner also works in Impact Wrestling. And the person who got it right was FJ05 because the answer was Eli Drake. And for those of you who don't know, just a quick rundown. Well, he debuted in The Rising with Drew Galloway, former Impact World Champion, as well as Micah, the son of uh, Hall of Famer Haku. He, too, was... Managed by Paul Bear, also um, known by his real name, the late Percy Pringle. And for those of you who know, obviously, he assisted Undertaker, Mankind, and Kane. And then, last but not least, his former tag team partner in the indie scene, Brian Cage, is actually our current X Division champion. So, congratulations to FJ05 for getting the right answer in Eli Drake. Yeah, that was a particularly tough one this week, I've got to say. Uh, so well done. Uh, this my question this week, so it's going to be really easy because, you know, whenever I do them, uh, I, I don't do a lot of in-depth research. I don't have the knowledge that Rose seems to have. So mine are usually fairly easy to get. So here we go. I haven't told Ro this, but I know he's going to get it. And, and by the way, this was one of my favorite wrestlers in, in uh, TNA, as it was. And might, some of you might be surprised by that. Okay, so my who am I? And I'm going to give you three clues. The first clue being, I appeared in WWE at one point, but it wasn't in a wrestling segment. It was in a kind of backstage skit where I was attacked by Edge dressed as Ric Flair. That's clue number one. Uh, second clue was, I debuted with a valet. Well, not really a valet, but uh, certainly a non-wrestling character. And my, both of our characters were based on a hit TV show. And the third and final clue is I lost my first title match. Uh, but when I say lost, I lost my, my first title, I should say, uh, when my partner in crime that I just mentioned was suspended in a cage during the match. Gotta love Russo. So, yeah, they're the three clues. I appeared on WWE TV in a non-wrestling skit. I debuted uh, with a valet based on a hit TV show. And when I finally lost my first title that I'd won, uh, my valet was suspended in a cage. So who am I? There you go. Do you know it, Ro? I'm going to have to think about it. We'll have to talk about it offline because now it's kind of <laughs> mind-boggling for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Well, I thought it would be easier than that, but there you go. All right, so that's our trivia question. So um, please leave us the comments below. And uh, one other thing I forgot to mention is it doesn't matter how you're listening to us, make sure you leave us some feedback of any kind whether it's on apple music on podbean soundcloud or wherever this show appears please do make sure you leave us your comments on there but if you want us to answer one of your questions try and hop over to the youtube channel which is where most of our content goes and uh, you can leave uh, a question for us in the comments section so what have you got for us this week from uh, the, the, the user comments bro all right the first one um and i'll have you answer this first is from colby cooper and he asks, what do you guys think about Impact spoiling their own title changes? Okay, well, 
I used to be dead against, you know, the pre-taped shows. Because, I mean, it's all to do with pre-taped shows, isn't it, this question? Um, because as soon as you pre-tape, you know, it's always going to get out that, that, you know, the title has been changed. I, I don't know. Do, do they actually reveal on, on the show, you know, and next week's show and those kind of things that uh, – and on, on their social media that they, they're – there's new title holders and things. Do they do that? Well, I'm not that's, sure. that's what they did most recently with uh, Tessa, because uh, I guess she had uh, TMZ actually had got where she called her parents and talk, talked about the win, and so then I guess Impact felt the need to uh, spoil it as well. I, I don't love it, but uh, as william smith in our comments would say you know impact is awesome and i love impact pay-per-views so you know what i would say is that if they are going to do this try and keep it to the live shows to, to avoid the spoilers the, the one benefit of taping so much in advance is that people do tend to read the spoilers but by the time the show airs it looks very different and they forget i mean for example you know most recently i you know where the titles are going to go but i've completely forgotten most of these storylines that have happened when you read them as spoilers so i, I think the damage that it used to do it is worse. I don't think it is but is bad now. And and what what you tend to find is that the people who comment on those and you know put lol T and A or whatever it may be, uh, it doesn't matter what impact does, they're going to get those assholes on social media commenting. Uh, for the true fans, you know, even if they read it, they think, oh, that's cool. I'm going to check that out. So I don't think it does as much damage as as, as we we think it might. But I would still, if I was them, try and keep it to live TV shows or pay per views. What about you, bro? What have you got? You know, I look at it from two different angles. For one, what I, what, the one thing that stood out to me from most recent, the Tessa Blanchard teleconference when she had mentioned the match and she was talking about during the time, yeah, this Sunday we're going to mix it up. And, you know, we know these are, are uh, pre-recorded uh, matches and uh, tapings, but I think sometimes the wrestlers themselves kind of forget. So when they're talking about stuff, you know, they're talking about this coming soon when in reality it's, you know, we're not going to see it for a couple of weeks. But, you know, the one thing I wondered, I looked at it from two two uh, fronts. On one end, it seemed like they wanted to get ahead of TMZ because, you know, we know with TMZ and TMZ Sports, you know, they they have no ties to the wrestling business. So, you know, they break stories when they find out. So it seemed on one end that Impact we just wanted to get ahead of it. Like, hey, well, we'll announce it ourselves than to have TMZ do it. But then another thing, too, and not, not that I'm trying to bash Impact, but it seems when we get, you know, a couple weeks where we get low ratings or, you know, the company gets low ratings, you know, they do this kind of as a boost to get everyone to watch you know, for the next week or to watch the particular taping where this change happens. And the one that comes to mind is when you think about with uh, Eli Drake, when Eli Drake won the Impact World Championship, when they had uh, announced it, on, they spoiled it on Facebook. And it see, and I remember the past couple of episodes, they didn't do uh, really well in the ratings. So it kind of felt like they spoiled it to try to get everyone to tune into that particular episode. So that's another way I look at it. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I like, and I, I agree with you, you know, the people who are, you know, so down and the naysayers, they're going to remain regardless. And so I don't think it hurts. And even too, when stuff is spoiled, when you look at on some of the sites for the people who do follow spoilers, a lot of times the way that it's reported and then how it translates in TV is totally different. And there's times that they've reported things where I'll never forget. They had one time where they said Josh Barnett had defeated Bobby Lashley for the Impact World Championship. Yet, you know, that particular episode airs. We don't see anything of that that relates to that. So sometimes, you know, things can change, you know, um, management and production can change things on the fly. So what's necessarily reported doesn't necessarily happen so yeah I, I don't think it's too much of a big deal do you think they should um do some false endings you know record stuff which is never going to wear just a screw with uh the people who spoil it you know for example you know have uh tito ortiz come down and win the world championship just for a laugh uh and just do it for the live audience you know and then then and then so that it never airs and people think what the hell's going on or do you think that's just an insane idea by someone who hasn't got enough sleep 
Well, I think with that, it could backfire because what if that's something that people are looking forward to and then when they tune in to that particular episode and don't see it, see it, they feel deceived. I think the one thing where I'll give credit to, you know, during the Bischoff and Hogan era where they used to uh, tape so much stuff and you never knew what was going to air one, uh, which particular week, which I think is cool in a sense. So it was it's like, even though you might know, you know, Jeff Hardy versus Mr. Anderson, Jeff Hardy beats Mr. Anderson. You don't know when it's going to air. You might think it's happening this upcoming Thursday, but it's happening, you know, two, three weeks from now. So, but yeah, I, I mean, I, th I think, you know, with everything they're doing, they just need to stay the course. I don't want to see them do anything that's reactionary because I think that'll take them off their game. Just continue to do what they're doing. Can I just say that no one would be looking forward to seeing Tito Ortiz with the title, except for me. But uh, I get your point. I get your point. Right. What's uh, the second question that we had this week? I think uh, you're going to ask what about ratings and things. Yeah. And, and I know we touch on this a lot, but, you know, the, sometimes, you know, and credit to a lot of you listeners, you know, your guys' feedback. That's why we encourage it. It's very important. You know, gives us other things to talk about. Um, this was more of a comment by Whoopsie saying that, you know, he believes people want to see the train wet train wreck people see the show is good they're not watching the train wreck that's why ratings have been low and he he was uh mentioning why do you think the e still has the ratings now i'll answer the second part first and then i'll answer the main part and then i want your take as far as the e i think at the end of the day they're the long tenure brand and i think people have a loyalty to that company no matter how terrible the content might be, you know, they're still going to continue to watch. That's just, it is what it is. I don't think people are at that point as much as online or the or social media and then online chat boards would have you think like, you know, this is the worst thing ever. You know, they still are faithful viewers. So I, I do think with impact, with all the good feedback they've got and you know up until this past week you know there wasn't really much negativity going on i think people are so accustomed to things happening so that's what gets people to tune in so the fact that we are getting some consistency with you know as far as great in-ring work and um great storyline angles and just everything has just been awesome i think for some you know like i said the naysayers you know it it doesn't really give them ammunition to anything so I, uh, you know, to some degree, I, I guess I kind of kind of believe that. So, but what, what do you think? Well, with regards to the ratings, I think I mentioned this before, it really depends on, on how important they are, are to Anthem. And what I mean by that is that, you know, I'm sure they don't really care whether the rating is at three viewers or 10 million viewers, uh, other than from ad revenue. Now, it depends what their, their deal is on pop. I mean, there was some talk at one point that they were running on one TV station for a while. It might be Destination America, where they were actually giving them the content for nothing and getting nothing back from Destination America, but just getting um, the ad revenue, in which case ratings mean a lot because obviously you want to get better sponsors, you know, so you get more ad revenue. Um, so it really depends on, on how important it is to impact and to pop as to what that viewership number is. It's not that important then, you know, so what? Because as we know, most people watch it on, on some platform, watch it on DVR, whatever it may be. I think if they wanted to actually improve those ratings, there's two obvious things they can do. One is a move channel and B is move night because, you know, if it's going to go up against Thursday night football, that's not going to change. All you're going to get is maybe, uh, how long is the off season? Three months? I don't know. Uh, that's the only time when you're going to get a boost in ratings in that case. But uh, then you can always complain and say there's Thursday night hockey. I don't know if that's a thing over in America or Thursday night baseball. So uh, I think the best thing to do is most probably look at a different night. And I know they've jumped around quite a lot. But what, what, what night's SmackDown on? Is it Tuesday night, isn't it? So when Wednesday night to me seems like the logical night to have a show. Or I think even better, and I, I mooted this before, how about having a Saturday night live show or Saturday night as the night to air it. Now, I know there's going to be a lot of other shows that, that want to be on a Saturday night prime time, but just think about it. If they're doing a pay-per-view and a set of tapings around a pay-per-view, uh, then when you get flying the wrestlers in, and if you did a live Thursday night impact show, then you're going to have to record two more shows that are out of line with what the results are going to be on a Sunday pay-per-view. 
So let me just take that forward. Let's just say Ric Flair's wins on a Thursday night. Oh, he's, he's due to win on the Sunday pay-per-view, but the live show's on the Thursday night. Then you're going to have two episodes that they're going to have to film on the Friday and Saturday night where Ric Flair carries around the belt before he's actually won it on the pay-per-view, if that makes sense. So why don't they go with a taping schedule where they start a live show on a Saturday night then another live pay-per-view on the Sunday, and anything after the pay-per-view is filmed on the Monday or Tuesday. So for, for me, I think the ideal night is a Saturday night, because then it helps with pay-per-view structure, with surprising people, those kind of things. Did any of that make sense, bro? No, totally, totally. I, yeah. I think, you know, my, my last thing on it is, I, the one thing I think, and I don't think they do enough of it, but I think, you know, I guess you could think, say the last big title change we've had on tv i know i had mentioned before it was lax but i forgot it was actually the sue young against ali in the last rights match you know we don't get a whole lot of title changes on television that much and i think you know and i know for some people they prefer especially when you're talking about like the world championship they prefer to see that change on a pay-per-view but you know you imagine when's the last time we had in the main event the exhibition championship change or even even the, I, I don't I think when the knockouts title changed I don't even think that was a main event meant ah, excuse me main event if I'm not mistaken so I I think sometimes when you have the big title changes especially when it's a long drawn out storyline and and you got this super baby face who finally gets their come up and, and gets the title I I think that gives a boost to ratings because you know people like that I think you know I always think back to when Eli won the world title. I mean, a lot of people were marking for that because everybody felt that it was well deserved. So, you know, you imagine if, you know, when we were talking about last week, if they were to bring back a James Storm and, you know, you build weeks in and weeks out to this big match they have on Impact and he finally gets, you know, uh, his second world title reign that he rightfully deserves. I think something like that will, even if it gets spoiled, people will want to tune in and see how that plays out. Yeah, I mean, we go back to the old example of Bischoff, didn't he? He came onto WCW when they were going head-to-head -head all the time um, and spoiled the, the Raw main event, saying that Mick Foley won the title. And everyone turned over to watch the pre-taped Mick Foley winning the title on WWE, or WWF as it was. So, yeah, it can, back, well, not backfire, but, yeah, people still want to see those, those title changes. But I think back then, obviously, you had much bigger stars and much more wide, mainstream-wide appeal. So, yeah, for me, if, if I was ripping up how wrestling landscape looked at the moment and Anthem had a choice of going wherever they wanted to. As I said last week, I would most probably go to a streaming service because it will give you a more accurate view of what the ratings look like because then it will count every view as and when it happens. Um, and I would move the, the, the premiere of, of each episode to a Saturday night. That's, that's what I would do. Uh, I, I know there's a few people last week who said, uh, I think it was MC Tan Man 1. Uh, thank you for your, your comment. MC Tan Man 1. Uh, if MC Tan Man 2 is out there, we'd like to hear your thoughts as well. Um, but yeah, he said, nah, man, fuck you, Tube Red. So I think he was quite clear on he didn't want to see that. So <laughs> thank you, MC. Um, but yeah, genuinely, thank you for your comment. But, you know, I, I would actually like to see it on a streaming service. Uh, and then that way you can debut it around the world at the same time, effectively. Um, but there you go. Um, thanks for the question. Who was it who, who asked? I don't know. There was two people who asked similar questions. I think Moon Mountain asked something about poor ratings as well and what they could do. And uh, did you say it was who, was... who was the other person who asked that? It was a whoopsie. He made... It was more of a comment. All right. Okay. Well, thank you to those two. And thank you to everyone who tuned in last week. We had... Uh, oh, we're getting close to that 50 thumbs up. Uh, thank you for everyone who did give us the thumbs up. And uh, no one gave us a thumbs down. We must be doing something right, bro. So keep listening. Keep uh, giving us your feedback, and we'll answer your questions when we can. So unless there's anything else, bro, should we dive into the review? Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Well, what did you think of the show, first of all? I mean, I feel like I'm going to come across as a fanboy gushing about it, but just week in and week out, this has just been some solid uh, programming. I mean, from the in-ring work to the storylines, just everything. I mean, you know, I can't remember the last time is, you know, it's, well, dare i say it's been a long time that i can honestly say watching impact you know looking forward to a week after week after week knowing that i'm going to be entertained and it's going to be a great show uh, abs absolutely and and you know what this week's show flew by and i always say that the, the great shows you don't reach for the remote you know to fast forward um and i, I tell you how good this show was I, I did something which i'm not proud of bro 
I'm really not proud of this. I watched the GWN flashback this week. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're going to have to get into that. That, that I, I will say I got a comment. I do have a comment on that. But once we get to it, we'll we'll talk about that. As I said, you know, that that uh, I'm slipping here. You know, that's my fast forward. That's my pee break, you know. But no, I watched I watched it this week. Anyway, yeah, I, I thought it was a great show as well. Let's let's dive into it. So anyway, before before we start, we had, um, you know, the build up, the video package of last week, those kind of things. And they continue to do these excel at doing these video packages. I think it's a guy called Kevin Sullivan, I believe, who does them. Uh, and, and they're just they're fantastic. You know, they really do these well. And it's, uh, you know, and I talk about this a lot. And, and it's something that happened in the main event, you know, with the, the camera work, you know, and the filmed outside location. Sometimes I think the bits that aren't video packages, I have a real problem with the production of them. And I've said this before on on the Sue Young stuff and the Madison Rain, is that it feels like a cheap horror film that you know a crappy film director is is cutting them but uh with the video packages at the beginning they are always fantastic and this this was no exception again but before we started we got into um a uh a tribute to jim the anvil neidhart who obviously passed away this week um what were your thoughts on jim the anvil if you remember him at all well at first, you know, I just knew he was part of the Heart Foundation as a child. But I'm going to tell you a funny thing. A lot of how I learned about a lot of wrestlers was through the WCW video games. And <laughs> I remember seeing him. And uh, when you click the button, he, you know, each wrestler had a particular rant. And his was like, oh, you know, I'm going to drop the anvil on you. So, you know, after watching him, <laughs> you know, I thought... You know, he, he in like we've always said with a lot of tag team wrestlers, you always have one who gains great success and then one who, you know, kind of gets lost in the shuffle. But, um, you know, I, I thought he, he served a great role. You know, he's a great hand, a big, a big dude, you know, and, you know, it's sad the way, you know, reading the details of his, you know, late death. I mean, late, I'm not late, but, you know, of his death, like, you know, it's unfortunate. So, you know, the wrestling biz lost another great one. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll be honest and hold my hands up here. I don't remember him at all in TNA. Uh, maybe it was during a period I didn't watch. But I certainly remembered him as a kid, you know, growing up in the WWF. And it, it was strange because when I was growing up as a kid and before you knew all the backstage stuff, and to some extent before you really knew it was fake, but nah, maybe we always kind of know it was fake. But, um, you know, even tag team wrestlers, people like, the Anvil and Greg Valentine and these people, you always felt they were like legitimate threats in matches. And these days you don't get that feeling from the mid carders and the tag teams. You don't feel like, you know, they could win the title, but you know, when you saw the Anvil wrestle, you think, Oh, he's going to win this match, you know, I, I, or, or, or I don't know who he's going to win this match. So, you know, he was certainly a fond, a, a fond memories of him from the WWF. And he obviously had a great look as well. So anyway, very sad news. And, uh, and yeah, rest in peace, Jim. Right, let's dive into the show then. Uh, so we had Sammy Callahan versus Phoenix. And before I saw this show, I read absolutely rave reviews about this match. What, uh, give us your thoughts, first of all, Ro. Pay-per-view quality. I was really surprised that this was something that they put on first and the length of the match. I mean, this was something that you would see on a pay-per-view. And while I was surprised, I didn't. I was uh, surprised to see Phoenix get the win. Actually, I, I thought Sammy Callahan would uh, uh, pull out the win in this, since his feud is mainly with Pentagon. I know Phoenix, obviously, with the relation with Pentagon being brothers and whatnot. So I was surprised on that. But yeah, this man. And I might add, you think about. In, in I don't know if you want to touch on this, but. For all of, all of you guys, I mean, it's probably, you know, the cat's been out the bag about Jeff Jarrett suing Anthem. You know, you think about those partnerships that under the Jarrett uh, regime, and then you look at the partnership with Lucha Underground, I think it's safe to say Impact has uh, benefited more from the partnership with Lucha Underground than those other partnerships, with the exception to somebody like Ishimori, because I feel every time I see Pentagon Jr. and Phoenix in the ring, they do not cheat us. They don't ever mail it in. They give it all. They, I mean, in this match, some of the stuff that Phoenix was doing, how he ran down the ramp and jumped up and did that Rana, like things like that. They put it all out on the line to really entertain fans, and you can appreciate that. Just on the partnership thing, they don't seem to play on that at all anymore. 
And, you know, when, when it first started, you know, they had, oh, we got so-and-so from The Crash. We got so-and-so from um, Noah. We got so-and-so from, was it AAA? I can't, I can't remember who the other one was. Uh, you know, so it, it was always played up on, on where they were coming from. You don't see that anymore. Other, other than Ishimori, everyone else feels like they're part of the roster. Now, I know most of them wrestle on Lucha. Most of them you know, wrestle on, is it Major League Wrestling, MLW? Is that what it's called? Um, so, you know, you get people appearing on other shows, but they don't make a big deal of it anymore like they used to. And to be honest, you don't really see any wrestlers other than, you know, the, the, the Lucha Brothers, Ishimori. Are we going to see him again? I don't know. Um, other than that, I can't think of anyone else who, Johnny Impact possibly, but all of them seem to be Impact wrestlers now as opposed to Lucha Underground wrestlers. And it, and it could be because of the way the tapings went, you know, the tapings might have been in the bank, in the bag already for Lucha Underground before they can make any, you know, changes, you know, to get them bringing out Impact stuff and those kind of things. So, yeah, you're quite right that was probably Impact to getting more value out of this. But at the same time, you'd have thought Lucha Underground was probably getting a bit of a rub from the fact that someone else is plugging their show as well. So I think it's working really well. And the ones that Jeff Jarrett negotiated with, we don't see much of it anymore. So, I don't, you know, we all know that Jarrett is just, you know, chancing his arm to try and get some more publicity here. <clears throat> but, you know, I think just giving back his stuff, you know, go and get a cardboard box, empty out the stuff from the, the Jarrett years, put it in a box, and there you go, Jeff, you can have it. Goodbye, don't come back. And by the way, I thought at some point Jeff Chow would come back to uh, impact in some capacity. Now we will never see him back. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, he in you know, for those of you who, you know, haven't heard, uh, BQ actually dropped a video most recently about it. So be sure to check that out on the channel. I mean, he has some points, but I just think it's just the timing. It's just like, I remember when it initially uh, went out that he was going to sue or, you know, trying to sue. I was just like, you know, it just seems, you know, the company just can't avoid, you know, something negative coming out. You know, they got all this great publicity. Even, you know, you think about stemming from um, Slammiversary and then, you know, for something like that to drop. I mean, but it is what it is. I mean, it's unfortunate. Hopefully, I'm just hoping that I don't want uh, Anthem and Impact to, you know, bend over essentially. But you know, handle it quick, swiftly, and then move forward. Don't let this be something that lingers over. Mm -hmm. Back to this match, though. Uh, actually, I, <laughs> there's something I do want to pick up here, and I'm sorry about this. We're, we're getting away from the match. We will come back to it, listeners, I promise you. But this this is a valid point, by the way. Um, and it is kind of tied in with old people, uh, very old in this case. But have you noticed the ramp? in this match where it's positioned and it was last week as well how they've had the set design have you noticed it uh, i don't really see any di any, any different so you got, well, you're gonna have to elaborate <laughs> the rampway comes down to ring height and you could you almost probably remember when phoenix comes in and he jumps over the top rope you know he wouldn't be able to do that if it was a normal ramp unless he had uh, a springboard of some sort last time we saw this was when hogan was in tna because Basically, his hips couldn't go up steps or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> um, also, NWO has been making a lot of noise that they've got a massive announcement coming back. Do you think Hogan could be coming back to Impact? No. And you know what? I think with, you know, when you think about the NWO, I felt like that was something that they captured, you know, back then in they've you know they because time and time again i know what it was in 2002 they tried to bring it back and it was a poor failed attempt but I, I think that was something that it was a big hit and then once it ended they always try to go back to it like if i mean i i think he's a e-lifer i mean i think that's inevitable i don't think he'd ever be an impact you know just the way impact is now and the way the company's changed it, like a lot of those people who were previously under the TN, TNA umbrella under the Dixie regime, I just don't think they would fit in this new era. Well, they wouldn't absolutely not fit. But the other thing, the other part of the puzzle, this is what got me thinking about it initially. And then I started, you know, like um, Russell Crowe in A Beautiful Mind, where you start seeing patterns in numbers which aren't there. Um, we've seen Kevin Nash two weeks of, in a row on the GWN flashback. And it got me thinking, 
Oh, please, no. Say it ain't so. Anyway, as I said, it's a conspiracy theory. Listeners, let us know. Would you like to see Kevin Nash and Hogan back in Impact Wrestling? I know what the answer is going to be, by the way. So you can answer anyway, but there you go. Anyway, back to the match. We are going to get on with this review one way or the other. I promise you, listeners. Right. So, um, yeah, a lot, lot of a buzz about it when I was reading the reviews before you know we start recording this thing, before I saw the show, because obviously we're a bit behind in the UK. But... Uh, it was a really long match. And as you say, this was a pay-per-view match. Fantastic stuff. And they could have finished the show very easily with this. And, and funnily, on the flip side of that, I thought that the street fight, although I loved it, and we'll come on to that, was very, very short. And um, they could have flipped these around, I think. Although, obviously, it's very hard to do the ending that they did with the street fight if they'd had it in the middle. But uh, amazing stuff. And do you know what? Sammy Callahan. He's some wrestler. People think of him as, as you know, someone who, who's hardcore, these kind of things, and, you know, as a major character. But he's, he's some wrestler as well. Some of the things they did in this match were just amazing. Yeah, you know, just great chemistry. And, I mean, he's becoming, well, not he's becoming, but I think they know what they have with him. Any few that they put him in, it's going to be money. And, I mean, we just seen, you know, and, <clears throat> excuse, me, excuse me, you think back, a couple months ago when the whole Eddie thing and he's been able to move on now with Pentagon now you know feuding with Pentagon and Phoenix so you know this guy man he's just he's well, like I said the MB MVP of uh, Impact 2018 Sammy Callahan by far uh, and, and you know for everyone raving about this match it takes two to tango and, and absolutely Sammy you know did his stuff in this match to make it to make it look awesome but there was one thing that that um I was really pleased with. I hate the spot where you get uh, a high flying guy jump over and take everyone out at ringside because usually it looks stupid and it looks like they only really catch one of them properly. And this time, it really looked like he landed on all three properly. So uh, perfectly executed. And um, for someone like myself who always says, you know, I don't really care about the quality of the match or the botches, I do point out when it's a good botch or a good movie. <laughs> and, and he hit this perfectly. But everything was good. You know, even the finish, I've never seen that. It was like a, a twisty muscle buster or something. I don't know what he did. But uh, excellent, excellent match. And the only thing I didn't like was uh, Pentagon coming out. And I, I, of course, he is going to come out. But uh, Pentagon looked awkward. And I think that was more to do with the way that the ramp was as opposed to anything else. But uh, all in all, great stuff. Really, really good. And then we find out that uh, after the match backstage, they catch up with Phoenix and he's getting a title shot at a uh, redefined against Brian Cage for the X Division Championship. So I was happy when, you know, hearing about redefined because I said, you know, I'm hoping that we'd get some, you know, how they have the little specials. And I figure that's something that we should have between now and Bound for Glory. So the fact that we're going to get that. That has me excited, and I'm really interested to see the clash of styles between Phoenix and Brian Cage. And, uh, yeah, so Redefined. That's an interesting name. And it's got two capital letters in it. R, small e, capital D. Uh, they bring attention to the word red. Is the amazing red coming back? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking with you listeners um, Yeah, so it's quite good well, What do you think about Brian Cage at this point? Because I know we love him in the ring And, you know, he wasn't featured on this show Other than in this, this one segment um, Once again, he didn't talk And we've talked, we've mentioned this before And I s said, you know, that at some point I would like to see him talk And yeah, I think you were the other way Do you think that you know, they, they put him in with a Lucha guy who did a cut a better promo than Brian Cage because he talked. Um, would you like to see a change in his character or do you think you're quite happy with his badassery carrying on like this? I mean, I think, you know, now, especially since she's champion now, I mean, I think it's okay. I mean, at first, you know, I was in the mindset, just have him not speak. But you, he speaks in the ring sometimes, you know, when he's interacting with fans, you know, or he might say you know, one more time or something. So, you know, to not talk backstage, but to talk in the ring, I mean, might as well uh, talk on the mic now, especially he's champion. So I don't have a problem with it now. Would, would, would you put someone like Scarlett with him, maybe, as his mouthpiece? No, because she strikes me more as a heel, and I think it's safe to say he's a face. I mean, by default, you could say. I mean, that probably has more to do with the fact that we don't have too many upper echelon faces. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't think that would really mesh well. 
See, I think the, the, the problem with him as a face, and he is a good face because of the way he wrestles and those kind of things, but you want, you know, monsters to look, to be heels. And he is a monster in that division. So it doesn't quite fit with his physique in that division. And I think someone like Scarlett would be perfect if, as his mouthpiece, but also it, it would play into the fact that she's saying she's, you know, a physical 10. And she could say the same about him, you know, because obviously, uh, like myself, he's completely ripped. Um, yeah, once again, anyone who knows me knows that that's not true. But yeah, so I, I think Scarlett would be a, an interesting person to pair with him. And it would be very easy to turn him heel, you know. And, and I know that's maybe a, we say that about everyone. Oh, let's turn them heel, turn them heel. With Brian Cage, because he is a bit of a nothing, although he's a default baby face, you know, you could easily turn him heel without having him speak. But anyway, that's going on to the future. So then we had my favorite bit of the week where we get uh, an Ali promo uh, with Kira, Kiera Hogan looking incredibly awkward. So, uh, yeah, she cut another thing on Sue Young. What did you make of this? Um, you know, just continuing the feud. I mean, nothing more. Um, <clears throat> but, excuse me. Dang, I've been coughing a lot in this cast. I apologize. But, you know, like I said, my, my only thing was it just felt like they were going backwards because, you know, one would have thought that this was over and now they're reigniting it. I hate that she brought up Madison Rain. I mean, I think that's unnecessary. I mean, if you're talking about your fighting on Rosemary's behalf, fine. But, you know, there's no need to bring up Madison at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll come back to that because obviously we've we've got the, the match later on in the show. But, but up next was Johnny Impact versus Jimmy Jacobs. And I thought, oh, before I say I thought, uh, I just want to say that the commentary team did a great job all night, but I thought they did really well selling G Jimmy Jacobs as a wrestler in this section and building him up as well. Because other than the fact that he, he's a weird looking dude, you know, going backstage and cutting promos for Congo Kong, I think a lot of listeners may not know who he is, you know, the casual viewer, if there's such a thing in impact, a casual viewer. But I thought they did a really good job all night, but especially in this building up Jimmy Jacobs. And I really liked Jimmy Jacobs' promo. Um, I really thought it was quite good. Yeah, you know, and before I think we had uh, missed the GWN uh, flashback. I wanted to. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that one next. Right. But yeah, they did. They did an excellent job presenting uh, Jimmy Jacobs as someone who's competent in the ring. Like I've known of his uh, wrestling background, but obviously, you know, we know some people later in their career. You know, they transition into a managerial role or you know backstage role you know not really a in-ring competitor so you know they did a amazing job talking him up like hey you know he's not no pushover so that helped me kind of get into the match a little bit because at first when i seen it advertised it's like why is he facing a manager and i mean we all knew what the whole end game was just to set up you know, between the matchup between Johnny Impact and Congo Kong. And, you know, they did a great job with that. So, um, yeah, it was cool. Nicely done. Yeah, the only thing I didn't like in this uh, is Johnny Impact. And uh, it, it wasn't so much the, the section before. I thought, you know, I liked the DDT onto the ramp way that he did, uh, the springboard DDT to take Kong out. But it was the bit after that where he was chasing Jimmy Jacobs around. But he couldn't just chase him normally. He had to do stupid parkour moves all over the place, <laughs> which was it just annoys the hell out of me. It's just so stupid. I mean... Why would you, when you're just running up three steps and jumping over someone who's ducking down, have to do a flip in the air? I mean, it's just ridiculous, and, and I just find it, well, hilariously bad. But uh, I did like the way that uh, Jimmy Jacobs kind of sold being knocked out completely. I thought it was good. Uh, I really enjoyed the whole the whole thing, really. You know, and I don't say that very often when Johnny Impact's involved. So uh, well done to them. Okay, you said you wanted to go back to the GWN, and my apologies. It's because when I read, uh, you know, I talk to listeners lots of times. You know, I read through uh, a review online uh, to to get my spoilers. And bearing in mind how good the G, well, I say I thought it was good. The GWN throwback was this week. Uh, I'm going to read you what it says in the review. And usually it's quite comprehensive, everything they write. They said, they played a GWN throwback moment where chaos ensued at the impact zone and everyone brought all over the place. Now, that really doesn't tell you what happened in this. So, so do you want to give us your thoughts on it first? Yes, let me say, I thought, you know, for the most part with these GWN flashbacks, I mean, I'll watch them. Some of them, you know, I'll enjoy. Some of them, it's like, God... 
I felt like first off this one went way too long they devoted too much time to this I mean just you know at first I thought it was just gonna be bits and pieces but they showed the whole you know extended everything like it it seemed like it took an hour I know obviously it didn't take an hour but you know it, it took a lot a big chunk of you know the show and the thing that I didn't like in it and you know you tell me and as well as listeners please share your thoughts on it it brought me back to during this time you know where we had you know the Kevin Nash the Mick Foley the Kurt Angle I won't say Sting too much because I felt like Sting you know he was working up and down the card but a lot of these guys who made their name to of fame in other areas taking up TV time were guys like Samoa Joe AJ Styles Daniels Eric Young you know a lot of these homegrown guys were taking a back seat and I, I just found myself saying they couldn't find a better one to air than this one because it, it just kind of just left a sour note in my mouth and you know when you bring up Kevin Nash and you think about when they're showing Kevin Nash I thought a uh, couple I think it was last week where they showed the one where Chris Saban had won a match and then Kevin Nash comes down and just beats the crap out of him like during that time it just it, it was a bad look for me just because it was like here are these guys that are trying to make a name for themselves and then you got these guys past their prime who already established you know essentially burying these guys and they're not really helping put anyone over so when they show this match it kind of just reminded me that and you know it went on too long too so that that's all I wanted to share on it uh well, you're gonna to have to be nice about Nash and Hogan soon because they're coming back. I'm sure of it. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. But no, I, I actually really enjoyed this one. I'm gonna disagree with you. I'm gonna completely disagree with you this because this is the first one that I've watched where I thought, man, I might go and get the GWN app for this one. Uh, I want to see what because I can't remember the context about it at all. I can't remember who was heel, who was face, why everyone was fighting. I, I don't remember anything about this. So um, yeah, th this was this is. I thought they did well and it did go long, but. I could have watched another five minutes of that. Did they all get arrested? I, I, how did it resolve? Do you remember? I think that's how it closed off. But I think the big thing during that time is really faction heavy. I want to say you were looking at the main event mafia. Um, I don't know if it was Frontline. It might have been. There was the World Elite. There was the World Elite. Yeah, like World Elite, British Invasion. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it had to be main event mafia. But I think Sting was at Sting was out of it. Um, but yeah, you had all, all these fa factions and, you know, they were just going at it. But, you know, like I said, it just during this time and where I was uh, down on the company during this time was they were bringing all these people in and they were putting them ahead of the homegrown guys. And, you know, nobody was really benefiting from it. And then once these guys left, you know, they trashed the company. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's what these old-time wrestlers do. I mean, you don't seem to see it so much anymore. You know, a lot of them are, are quite respectful. Although, Samoa Joe, maybe not. Um, he's about the only one I think who's left who, who hasn't been still quite nice to Impact. But anyway, we're not going to dwell on that one. Up next was the Smoke Show. Uh, what did you think of this? Because, well, actually, I'm, I'm going to tell you my thoughts on this, first of all. It had KM and Falabar in it, who I thought did an excellent job. I thought they really did. These two have got really good chemistry, and uh, and I, I just I just actually thought the segment was very good. Although I don't really understand what the smoke show was supposed to be. Um, is it like an agony aunt section? I, you know, they haven't really defined it other than the fact that they gave a backstage skit a, a title. Um, but uh, you know, if they're going to repeat the smoke show week in week out, you've got to kind of understand what it's supposed to be. And I, and I don't know at this point. But having said that, I really did enjoy this. But the reason why I'm up so early this morning is because the last thing I, before I went to bed last night I watched was KM's tongue darting towards me, and it's given me it's given me the night terrors ever since. So <laughs> I I thought it was very funny though the whole segment I thought it was good. You know I had thought originally when they were talking about it that it was going to be an in ring segment. You know I was thinking more in lines of the facts of life or you know when the wrestler has some sort of talk show in the ring. You know. Uh, it, I didn't have too much of a problem with it. I think you have to look at it for what it was. It became a comedy bit because you look at the two people involved in KM and and Fala. And, you know, you always uh, preach this, and I'm in agreement with you on this. Like, they're a fun tag team. And I hope, 
down the road, you know, they decide, hey, let's give these guys a run and see what happens because these guys in the and I think even KM now is starting to get over on his own as well. I think before he was just he was pretty much riding the coattails of Follows Wave, but you know KM's gain, gaining some traction too. But these guys, man, they they should never break them up. And I mean, I know <laughs> with tag teams they eventually break up, but these guys just together, man, they really found something with these two. It's funny we talked about Jim the Anvil at the beginning, and you know that kind of tag team, and, and they've got that. Feel of, a, of a tag team about them, you know, that they're character led and those kind of things. And KM, I, I really like him as a talker and an actor as well. I thought he was really good in this segment. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I hope they do go with these guys. And, 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 you know, we most probably all feel that the Desi Hit Squad might be next. But I, I really could see them putting the belts on KM and Falabar and, and really making some money because these guys, I'm sure they'll be selling more merchandise than the Desi Hit Squad ever will. Uh, you know, so uh, go with them. But th- overall, I thought it was a good debut of the Spoke Show. I just like to see what it's going to be each week. But it does look like it's going to be someone sitting down with Scarlet and having a, a kind of agony out moment with her. But yeah, fair play. Let's get let's move on though. So next, and this was going to be the only point that I'm going to be down on the show this week, and it's nothing to do with what transpired on the screen. But Austin Aries came out to the ring and started talking about Killer Cross, and Killer Cross came down and those kind of things. The only negative i can say about this week was that anthem should have got is it atlas security or whatever it is to go into the crowd and beat the shit out of that guy who kept on shouting what over the promo of killer cross i don't know if you heard it but it annoyed the hell out of me there was one guy who just wanted to go what 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 you know like uh, the stone cold steve austin thing and i just wish they would have just dragged that guy out and beat him to a pulp because i thought it was good. I heard it a couple of times, you know, and I didn't know. I thought it was just a two-time thing, but, I, you know, maybe they had muted it. You know, I read online. Um, I forgot where I seen it. I see it on some common board. And, you know, I'm interested to see how it plays out. But, you know, they had said, you know, why have Killer Cross paired, paired up with Austin Aries? Only because, you know, you figure Austin Aries, you know, he's good enough to be on his own where he doesn't really need a hired gun and killer cross is you know, really starting to find his groove so you know to have him aligned aligned with austin aries you know usually that means one of two things you know he's going to do his dirty work or in feuds people are going to go over him before they can get to austin aries so you know and it just it had me thinking a little bit you know, because it just looked like the way that they were going, you know, they were just going to have a run through people and eventually he was going to get, you know, his first big feud. So, but, you know, I'm giving uh, Impact the benefit of the doubt. I want to see how this all works out. But, I mean, it looks like for the time being, you know, it's an insurance policy to keep the belt on uh, Austin Aries. Well, what I really do like about it is that, you know, he came out and he said, you know, he can speak for himself. And, I, and what I really didn't want to see was like a Tyrus who just sits there, you know, and, and helps out those kind of things. It looks like Killer Cross is going to be cutting some promo time and those kind of things. And he's got a great look, isn't he? You know, whatever look he comes out in, he looks good, you know, and this, you know, he's wearing the long trench coat with, with a tie and those kind of things. He looks really cool. And he even no sold the kendo sticks for a little while. So, you know, I, I like the fact that they are making him out to be, you know, a tough guy. The only thing is, it's kind of moving away from his is insane random attack, you know, kind of, oh, what's the word of theme that, 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 you know, he's been portraying. And I get, you know, that they're saying that Austin Aries is going to feed him people. But as you said, I, I do worry that he's going to be the gateway to get to, to Aries. I just hope they do something different. And I, I, how they do that, I don't know. But all in all, I thought it was a good segment. And I, I like Eddie Edwards as well. And, and we'll come back to him in a second. Um, Oh, no, no, that was next, wasn't it? I, they, it was after the break that uh, Eddie Edwards had a backstage segment where he was going nuts with Alicia. And I, and I really liked that segment. Eddie Edwards is turning into not a bad actor in this crazy state. Yeah, it's it, it's interesting what they have found with him because, you know, now you, we see him, I don't want to say he's comedic, but, you know, he, this crazy guy, <laughs> you know, he goes in the ring and, uh, you know, we see him try to cane... Uh, Killer Cross 
and and then in the process trying to get to Austin Aries, and then that's when uh Killer Cross hits that choke on him. I think he calls it the Hurt Business or something. And it's a brutal choke for a guy that size, that choke. But you know, then we see him backstage with Al- Alicia, you know, teasing maybe you know things aren't all good, you know, between the two of them, you know, stemming back from the whole Callahan ordeal. So you know, it's interesting what they've been able to do with him post Callahan feud. So, and I, I like the fact that they had him face Austin Aries for the world title because now at least anytime they need a world title contender, they can always rely on him, you know, him being a former world champion. I believe it's called the cross jacket choke, according to the spoilers I'm reading or the review I'm reading. There you go. Um, so up next, we had Eli Drake and Joe Hendry. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm actually really liking Joe Hendry. Uh, his entrances are brilliant. I don't know how long he can continue doing this without it getting boring, but um, I thought this was great, the, the, you know, the, the little promo video he did beforehand. No, I have no problem with him. I just want to see Eli Drake move on to bigger and better things. I think he's better than this, and there's no disrespect to Joe Henry. I think to get Joe Henry, Hendry oh, sorry, over, you know, you have him work his way up the card, you know, facing Eli Drake, I mean, that's usually when you reach top of the pop. So I just want to see Eli move on to something else. Sorry, if I could just interrupt on this one. Uh, two things you said there, which kind of brought me back to last week's show. I said I couldn't remember what the the, the, the other match was for the British tapings. Uh, and it was Eli versus Joe. And they spoiled it by saying it's currently 1-1 and they're going to have their, their third match. So they spoiled this week's result. Uh, last week, uh, as we were talking about earlier on. But you're quite right. I think that this is below Eli, but it does take him out of the main event scene. And and the problem that you've got with Eli being in this segment is, is not the fact that he's facing Joe Hendry. It's just that at the moment, Joe Hendry has got the Grado stink about him. Um, and I don't mean that badly, because I like Grado. But at the same time, it's Grado that's making this a lower card feud. Uh, if this was Joe Hendry versus Eli Drake with no one else involved, it would be quite a good feud. Um, but with the whole Grado Katarina segment, it kind of does drag it down to well mediocrity a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, it just doesn't like. It just seems like I think if you're trying to get Joe Hendry over, I thought in you know you want to let things play out. Obviously, you don't want to like fantasy book or you know try to put bits and pieces together. You want to see how it plays out, but you know, you would have thought, you know, a feud between Hendry and Grado would be the best way to go, you know, to get Hendry over. But, yeah, you know, I'm happy Eli got the win. I don't know. I'm not really sold on this association with the Colts of Lee, but could be interesting. It's just a shame that the Cult of Lee and these tapings have been given nothing to do other than to eat some pins and to um, to be... Eli Drake's lackey. It's a bit of a shame because, you know, you know how high I'm on the cult of Lee. But th- I thought they were great ringside, by the way, when, especially when the promo was airing uh, of uh, Joe Hendry. <laughs> the look on, on Trevor Lee's face was just, uh, it was brilliant. I loved it. Anyway, um, so the result of the match, obviously, uh, Eli picked up the win after Grado got on the apron and Eli pushed uh, Joe into into Grado, causing the roll-up. So, yeah, it was all right. Um serviceable match and it, it kind of it, you know progresses the storyline between Eli and Grado doesn't it so uh, it, everything's moving forward and, and unfortunately although we've got a British te- you know match of Eli versus Joe it looks like Eli's still stuck in this program for the time being where, where do we where do you go now with with Eli after this because I'm guessing Joe is going to win because it's not very often you get a debuting star who wins but that doesn't mean that that pushes Eli down how would you reintroduce it Eli into the main event picture. I really think what they need to do with Bound for Glory coming up, I'd run some type of tournament to have a number one contender. I I think that's the one thing that the company they've gotten away from. Instead, you know, a lot of times we we might see, you know, well, hell, we we might not even see that. A lot of times, you know, somebody is just they win a match next week. Hey, you get a title shot. You know, I think the missed art of having maybe a fatal four-way number one contenders match and I think you put Eli in a match like that that puts him back in the mix of things he doesn't necessarily have to win but the fact that he's associated with that you know you always he can always be seen as a a credible threat so if I was doing it that's the route that I would go 
I, I personally would most probably thrust them into the main event picture straight away and have him go full baby face and take out Killer Cross, allowing Eddie to go at Austin Aries. You know, and that provides a really good feud for Eli that's maybe not for the title. But we talked about someone going through Killer Cross, and I think that might be the way to do it. So Austin Aries retains against Eddie Edwards, but the reason being is that Eli Drake has started a feud to take the insurance policy out, and that turns Eli babyface, which is what they're desperately needing, and it sets up another feud for Eli versus Aries, and this time the roles are reversed of who's the, the baby face and who's the, the heel. So that's the way I'd go with it. But there you go, Fantasy Booking 101. I'm an expert on that. Let us know, listeners, where do we go with Eli Drake next? Right, so we had a Matt Seidel segment. I love this. Once again, another really good video package, although creepy as hell. What with KM's tongue coming towards me and now Matt Seidel's third eye in the middle of his forehead. Whoa, I'm not getting any sleep. Yeah, this this was, uh, I don't want to say show stealer, but this had me just like, wow, where do they go with him? You know, like, it's interesting, you know, to devote this time. It, we've talked about this in the past. I know most recently I actually commented on one of the co- most recent comments, but, you know, a lot of times when somebody loses a championship, they easily get lost in the shuffle. And, you know, we might not see them, and then next thing you know, they're gone. But, We've seen that they've continued with Matt Seidel's character to keep progressing and progressing. You know, even talking about his uh, shortcomings in matches as far as losing the X Division Championship and the rematch as well as losing to Pentagon Jr. So they obviously have some big plans for him, but it just remains to be seen where they thrust him to. Prediction time. Is Matt Seidel going to come down to the ring soon with an eye painted on his forehead? I don't think it'll go that far. <laughs> I'm going to go for it. So there you go, listeners. Vote Team Row. That's no to the I. And, or Team Adam. Yes, he is going to come down with an I. I reckon he will. That's going to be part of his new gimmick. I'm sure of it. Anyway, <laughs> that, that killed the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Sammy Callahan uh, cut a promo with OV backstage talking about the Mexican death match next week. Because uh, if you didn't know by now, they are for Ohio, by Ohio, and they're taking over. I can't remember what they're taking over, but something. No, it's everything. Of course it is. Nice promo. I, I love Sammy Ca- Callahan and OV. I, I really like an M. How long? Okay, prediction number two of the week. How many weeks before Jake Chris gets his head, head shaved? Two. Two weeks, yeah. I, I'll go with that. There's no team Adam and no team Ray this time. I think two weeks is about fair. I, 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 maybe I'd even go next week. All right. Okay, so then we had the Sue Young versus Ali match. And uh, only thing that, that bothered me with this, well, there's only one. Actually, do you know what? I said earlier on, I only had one thing I didn't like about this show, and it was the guy in the audience screaming. I didn't like this match, um, and it's because, once again, Ali is a terrible wrestler. I'm sorry, listeners. She's terrible. I, and every match that she does now, I just keep on watching it thinking, she's going to get better. And and these two have not gelled whatsoever. Whenever they are put in the ring together, they stink up the place. I'm sorry to say. And I know I'm going to get some backlash for this one. Why Were you as hard on it as me? Well, I know folks have been critical about Sue Young's work, too. Um, it was fine. I mean, I, you know, I find myself watching a lot of these matches sometimes where, you know, yeah, some you could tell the mat technicians from the showmen's and some people who were just competent to ones that aren't. It, it wasn't a problem for me. Um, you know, just really story storyline advancement. And then I really liked the post match. I thought that was the thing that really stuck out to me where you have Tessa involved and then Sue Young actually interacting with Tessa because a lot of times, you know, we see heels stick together and they beat up on the baby face. And they could have easily went that route, which would have brought out Kira Hogan. But no, they had Sue Young attack Tessa and uh, put the uh, purge on her. Mandible Claw, for those of you who might not know. And then we have Ali standing tall after hitting, I think she did a code breaker, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, I, I really like the post-match more than, than the match itself. Yeah, well... To, to, well, a couple of things on this uh, about the match. Uh, maybe I'm a bit down on it more than anything, but it was the wrestling I didn't like. I, I like the angle, I like the build, I like the post-match, but uh, a few little stray observations. I thought the image of where the bridesmaids were just stood there staring off into space was very, very good. I quite like that imagery. Um, 
also a bit weird that Sue Young top, took a top off, uh, quite right, or a dress off. I, I've never seen her do that before, and I don't quite know why she did it this time. But uh, okay, she does that. She does that when she's getting ready to do that. Uh, from the ring apron, that somersault, she uh, she takes the dress off. I've never seen her do that. Maybe I'm, I'm not paying attention that much. But yeah, okay. Uh, uh, happy to be wrong on that one. Um, the other thing is, was Kira Hogan's footwear. <laughs> I always pick up on, on ring attire. But she was wearing these big old boots, which just looked really odd when she did the kick on the apron to one of the bridesmaids. Or she did something, or she ran on the apron to kick someone, I think. And it just looked really odd that she was wearing these high wedge boots that just, I don't know, it just looked weird to me. Uh, and what she was wearing, in, in total, she did look... Um, I don't know. Uh, more common, I think that's maybe a British word. But she didn't. She didn't look like. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't even know where I'm trying to go with this. She didn't look very nice this week, is what I'm trying to say. And it's a shame because uh, you know I, I think that she's got a lot of potential in her. But the ending, where, as you say, Tessa got the the mandible claw, the purge, and then I think she was super kicked by Ali while she was in that move, and then Ali took her out with the code breaker. Great finish to the match. Really good finish to the match. But, um, yeah, I think it's going to be setting up a three-way by the looks of it. It's a good way to get Tessa involved. Yes, I think what it does, it throws a wrinkle into things now because, you know, they could have easily given us, and I mean, it hasn't been confirmed yet, I don't know, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, I know she had mentioned something, uh, Tessa had mentioned something about it on the teleconference, but, you know, it, it gives an interesting wrinkle into things because, you know, if you would have said before to do it, is you're going to think like, well, you know, the two heels versus one face is going to be pretty much a handicap match. But having Sue Young interact with Tessa, I mean, dare I say maybe we see the title change hands, you know? So yeah. I, I really think I'm really looking forward to if we do get that match, when that match occurs. I think that's the main event quality. Um, but we, we just have to see when we get the match. I'm, if I had to guess, I'm going to say I redefined. Yeah, I would guess that as well. And what it does do, though, it, it takes Kiera out of the angle a little bit if it's a triple threat. So it might go four-way. But uh, then next week, I've, I've done, you know, I thought, well, maybe Kiera will feud with the maid of honor, Casey Spinelli. Uh, but then next week, I see advertised it's Kiera versus Alicia Edwards, I believe, on next week's show. Is that right? Uh, I've usually got the rundown. Oh, well, 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 we'll talk about that at the end. Anyway, right. Okay, so we're now on to to main event. Unless there's anything else that I've missed, um, but yeah, we had a the street fight, the LAX, the LAX. What if I've called them the LAX? LAX versus the OGs in a street fight, and I don't know what you thought of this, but I just thought the whole segment was brilliant. And I wish it would have gone a bit longer. There was actually very little wrestling in this and very little moves. There were some bits which I didn't like, which I'll come on to in a second. But but what, what did you make of this? Um, it, it was more, it just came across more as a, a, a backstage angle, not necessarily a match, which is fine. Um, eventually, we're going to get some big payoff between these two groups. Are we? Do, do you think we will? Because like, to me, it felt like th this is the end of it. Nah, I really feel there's going to be the one big match that pays off to it because we see, you know, the ending with King uh, challenging Conan to hit him and then Conan uh, swings the, I think it's a slapjack and, uh, uh, you know, it fades out. So I think, you know, we're due to one uh, blow off, for, I mean, pay off for this feud, you know, one blow off match. So, um, yeah, but I, I took it more as a backstage angle and... Uh, yeah, nothing more. But yeah, I, I thought this was nicely done. I, I I disagree with you on this. I think this was the payoff. I really do, you know, because it seemed you know, they've got their titles back. They've beaten them again in the fight that made them famous. They took the title, and King's been taken out by Conan. And to me, this screams, this is the end of the feud, which is why I said it, it was a bit disappointing. It was quite short, but maybe you're right. Maybe you're wrong. Team Bro, Team Adam, let's hear your thoughts. Uh, What's going on with this one? Do you think it's going to continue? And obviously, no spoilers, please, if you do know of anything. I personally don't. But going back to the match, uh, there were some bits that I liked. And I don't know where they got these <laughs> the gags from. <laughs> that was quite funny, having random people suddenly, uh, you know, walking down the street with them. But uh, I, I just thought I loved the edge to it. You know, the swearing, 
those kind of things, which, you know, is, is a million miles away from PG. But I just think it works so well with, with this faction. And, you know, I, I just loved it. I, I thought it was really good. I didn't like the sharpening of the fork and, you know, putting out a shiv by the looks of it. And he was going to stab it with a shiv. It, to me, that takes me out of the moment when you see things like that, because that, you know, borders on criminality, if you like. You know, that's assault. That's attempted murder. So I, I don't like that because it, it takes me out of the moment. But um, two things that came out of this for me, which I, I want to pick up on, is that they did make Santana and Ortiz, both of them, look like stars in this. They, they really did. They did a fantastic job. In the last few weeks, I've been down on Santana, maybe not looking as good as Ortiz. But Ortiz looked great in segments. And that, that, that image where Santana picks up the belt in slow motion, takes off his, off his top, and you know, kind of looks off to Ortiz. That 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 was brilliant. That that is how you build a star. I think with this angle, what it's really done and it's really helped LAX. You know, it's really put them. I mean, we already seen them as the face of the tag team division. You know, just based off of their success, three time tag team champions. So I think whenever they do decide to drop the championships. You know, de- depending on the team, I mean, the right team can really uh, get benefit from that rub. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know who's next, but yeah, um, listeners, let us know what you think. And I, well, before we do that, what do you think of the ending as well? Did Did you think Conan was going to do that? Um, I thought the way that they did it, you know, we just we don't know what happens. I thought that was a creative way of doing it because, and I think that's what leads me to believe that this feud's still going to continue because, you know, obviously if you kill off uh, uh, Kingston, or King, I'm sorry, then, you know, feud's no more, obviously. So we don't know what happened. So, you know, we got to tune in next week to find out what actually happened. Because, you know, for all we know, he could have swung it and then held back or missed or anything. So, yeah, we got to just see what happens. Yeah. I don't think they're going to go uh, Karate Kid 2 on us where Mr. Miyagi gives a, a nose bump to uh, John Kreese. Yeah, that, that's an old school reference there, if anyone knows what I want about. Uh, but I do think, uh, I, I, I think this is it. I think we just assume that that's King out in the picture now, which is a shame because King has been amazing. Uh, but where do you go with King now? I, I don't know, unless he builds a new new LAX. Yeah, can we see that? No, I can't see that. But I can't, see, I can't really see where they go with King now because the two big matches they've had, they've lost... And they've got the belts back, so I think that's it. But anyway, another another fantastic show, and what a brilliant way to finish it. Really, really good. So, anything else for this week's show that you wanted to uh, to mention? No, just you know, some solid programming once again. I mean, they've really found a recipe to how they design these shows. I mean, we get a good, nice blend of in-ring action. Backstage segment, storyline. I mean, I guess the one criticism, and I, you know, notice a lot of uh, commenters, you know, leave this as well. It's just the way that they do the GWN flashback. I mean, personally, I think they should just scrap it all together and leave it for explosion. But, I mean, it looks like it's here to stay. I would just hope they choose some of the matches wisely. Because, like, I, and I know you, you had talked about with this one previously. You enjoyed the match. But... Some for some of these matches that they show, it brings up it could bring up obviously the good memories of the old TNA and then some of the bad memories. And that this particular one had just brought me back to uh, you know, the time where we're seeing the older talent being pushed in favor of these homegrown guys, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, well, well, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, share your sentiments on that one. Um, um uh, the, uh, the GWN, GWN flashback, flashback is usually, usually as I say, my toilet break, but this, this week I enjoyed it, but it wasn't really a match, that was the problem, wasn't it? It was more of a brawl, and with things like that, I'm always interested, so. Anyway, let's hope they, they figure out what they're going to be doing with this eventually, because I think it might help them having Jeff Jarrett sue them, believe it or not. I think it might help them get rid of it, as you said. Anyway, um, thanks for tuning in this week. I'm going to remind you of the trivia question. Uh, in, in a little while, but first of all, Ro, do you want to give us a rundown of what's on next week's show? Yeah, um, to my understanding, this is all I have, is I guess we're going to get Brian Cage speaking. Um, so, you know, we were talking about earlier about him talking, so I guess it doesn't matter whether we think he should talk or not, because he is. 
and then the Mex- Mexican death match between Pentagon Jr. and Sammy Callahan. And before you close out, I'm interested to see the Mexican death match because and BQ always mentions it sometimes where the company will talk about certain matches and really all they are are recycled matches but with just a different uh, title. You know, the one that comes to mind is when Rosemary and Taya had the demon dance and essentially it was kind of like a monster's ball or a street fight. So, you know, and I don't expect it to be an actual death match, death match. Um, those, <laughs> those type of matches, I mean, I don't, I can't see any of major company actually airing those type of things. But I mean, hey, who knows? <laughs> well, what is a Mexican death match? So uh, if I, is it just a hardcore match or is it? You know, barbed wire ropes. What, what? What is it? See, and that's the thing. I don't know. Um, you know, I I don't think it's an actual death match. Death match. Um, but Hey, don't forget to leave a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Check out the video below for more Impact Wrestling related content. This is the Impact Lounge.